Today on the podcast, we have Scott Herman, who has millions of followers following his fitness channels on YouTube. He's also the co-founder and VP of Strategic Partnerships at Wagme. So in this episode, we go through his journey of starting up his YouTube, to building his following, to sticking at it, how does he keep motivated over so many years, and then why he transitioned to becoming a founder of a more traditional startup style business, how his creative skills enabled him to get their role and thrive in their role, and what advice he has for you if you're looking to go from creator to founder. Let's get on to the show. So, Scott, you started on YouTube back before it was cool, before the creator economy was even really a thing, right? So it was in 2009. What got you started? Because obviously, you didn't know you were ever going to end up where you are today. Back in 2009, I had just got off of my first reality TV show called The Real World Brooklyn. And I had worked in a gym my whole life. I started working in a gym when I was 14. Um, and then when I was 23, I left to film the show. And then after the show filmed, I was living in New York City. And I, I, I went about a year and a half without really doing anything fitness related because I was pursuing modeling and acting and, and showbiz and all that stuff in New York. And I just started just really missing helping people reach their fitness goals. Like it was just literally in my, my apartment in New York City, you know, my small little cube that I lived in with two roommates. <laughs> and <laughs> I was just like, you know. I really miss helping people reach their goals. And I got a camera. Again, I just got off a reality TV show. So now I'm, I'm kind of on camera for three months straight. So I'm like, okay, maybe I can utilize this new thing, you know, YouTube that's kind of getting popular with my friends at least and make some content to help people. And I quickly started realizing as I uploaded those videos that a lot of people were searching for that type of content. And as I continued to upload those videos, I would upload, you know, at least one video a day. And I would go back to the first video every day and go through every single one and answer all of the comments I missed. And then people who replied, because they would ask questions about their, you know, how to reach their fitness goals, I would reply to them. And so it got to a point to where I was literally going back to video one and going through like 15, 20 videos, answering comments like crazy. And that's how I started to really build a solid community. At that time, I still had no idea you could even make money on YouTube. I was I was literally living off of doing appearances at bars and clubs for the real world. <laughs> like that was how I paid my bills. The guy who worked at the Google offices in New York had just watched my season. And then obviously working at Google, he heads the YouTube department. He saw that I was making videos. And so he shot me an email. He's like, hey, you know, you can actually make a living doing this. Why don't you come down to the Google offices and I'll show you how. And so I went to the Google offices. His name was Ben. Ben showed me exactly what to do. He's like, hey, if you're consistent, there's no promises, but, you know, maybe you could turn this into a business. It's like, great. So I had to make a decision. And it was around that time that I got asked to do the challenge for Real World. So it's a popular TV show where everybody you know, it's a big challenge, all these different things you have to do. And I really wanted to do the challenge. And it was probably the only reason why I did the real world to begin with. But I kind of had to make a decision. It's like, well, do I go home, go back to, you know, New Hampshire, Massachusetts and work on this YouTube channel or go do the challenge and continue that life. And I just felt like the the best opportunity that was also the most gratifying to me was helping people. And so then I moved back home. I went back to the gym that I was a general manager of called Answers Fitness in North Attleboro, Massachusetts. And I started just filming videos full time while working full time. And so I would literally work until 10 o'clock at night and I would lock the doors and a couple of my clients would come, Cliff and Tom, and we would film videos till like one, two in the morning of me just doing those original how to, those two minute how to videos on every exercise in the gym. And back then it was great. You could upload like 10 videos at a time and the algorithm didn't care, right? It's like so different back then. What's interesting as well is that there's so many people trying to get in content since the pandemic, right? So the last three or four years who are, uh, they haven't hit that level you've hit yet of that longevity. And obviously things change over time because at the beginning it's new, it's fresh as the honeymoon period. But you've been through that honeymoon period, seen so many algorithm changes, seen so many things change. What kept you going? Like, let's say five years in or 10 years in, 
well, I guess what even keeps you still going today in the content creation space? Because it must be hard. You've done so many videos. How do you keep yourself motivated? So I guess for, for me, right, it was never about making money in the beginning. I mean, even, I mean, obviously, yeah, at some point it became about like, Hey, I need to make more money to pay bills and expand my business. But what really kept me focused and happy was, you know, wanting to teach fitness to the world. Like I just was doing it because I genuinely wanted to do it to help people. And I feel like a lot of people now they see a becoming a creator or quote unquote influencer as a path to fame and attention and likes and DMs and, and all these things where if that's the reason why you're doing it, like the main reason, there's no there's no real passion there. So when you start to get to like creator burnout, it's called where you're just creating so much content, you just, you know, you just fizzle out for a while. It's because it's not really coming from your heart. It's not really coming from a place of I'm doing this because I absolutely love it. It's more like you're doing it um, because you think it's going to entertain people. There's a funny, there's a funny clip on Family Guy. I don't do you, do you know who Tom Green is? He was kind of crazy. He would do crazy, crazy stuff for attention. And so there's this clip on Family Guy where Tom Green is laying down underneath a cow in a tutu, sucking milk out of the udder. And he's like, Can I stop doing this yet? Am I famous yet? Can I stop doing this? And you know, it's and it's funny, but when you think about that, it, it really proves the point I'm trying to make where people are just doing th- shit for attention. And Although it's funny, it's like, you know, likes don't really pay the bills, right? You got to have a business to support what you're doing. And then there's a an acronym that my father brought me up on called gained attention, lost respect. And I, I actually recently called somebody out um, on the crypto side of things because they were they were talking shit about my about wag me when they clearly did zero research. And we were in the DMs like chatting because I was, I said something to him and I'm like, if you get a problem, just shoot me a DM. And then he's like, oh, you know, you made that whole post about me. Thanks for the attention. Huh? Like, 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 like he thinks that like, because I made that post, he gained a hundred followers or something. I, I don't know what he was thinking, but I said, I was like, listen, man, I said, you know, yeah, he got a little bit of attention from my post. Cause I called him out. I said, but yeah, gained attention, lost respect is probably something that you should hold near and dear to your heart. Cause you're young because I called you out because you clearly had no idea what you were talking about. But this generation of people, this generation of creators, any attention they think is good. They think any intent, any intention is going to elevate their brand. And it's not like when you're creating a brand, you have to figure out before you even start filming, like just sit down, get off the computer, get a pen and paper and, and a notepad and figure your shit out. Why am I doing this? What do I want to do? What is the end goal? What kind of, you know, audience do I want to attract? If you want to eventually have some sponsors to help, uh, you know, um, with the bills and whatnot, what kind of sponsors do you want to look out for? In the fitness space, especially, I think one of the things that helped me um, last as long as I did is I never just sold out to anybody willing to give me money for products. I mean, there's a lot of really weird things that people promote in fitness, right? Like a lot of weird you know, exercise equipment and and some exercise equipment that literally, you know, the people inventing it think it's going to be the next big thing. But at the end of the day, it's like, I don't need 17 different variations of a barbell, right? Like the the basics work for a reason, or I'm not going to, I'm not going to sell a detox, you know, tea or detox lemonade. Like all those things are just, they just, they're, they're fads, right? So understanding that if you want to have a brand that's going to last the ages, you have to have passion, you have to have focus, you have to avoid selling out. um, And you have to understand that there's a saying called gained attention, lost respect. And at the end of the day, your brand is all you really have. And as soon as you start to lose the trust of your community, that's the start of the downfall. You built a huge amount of trust in the fitness space, right? And what's interesting is now with me, it's a different space. It's not it's tangential. It's not necessarily like use leveraging the brand you built through the fitness side. So what got you in, involved in the gaming world and the web free world as well? Like how did that come about? So it's actually a really interesting story because I got into crypto because I had a buddy of mine tell me to buy Shiba Inu before it did that like massive parabolic pump the first time. And I made 
quite a bit of money off of that and sell it all. It's my first big pump. So, you know, you never really, never really sell it all in your first big pump. Right. Um, but then, you know, it pumped, I took some profit and went down and then it pumped even higher after Shiba swap came out. So this is around the time that I got into crypto and, that really just piqued my interest because as you, we talked about earlier, I mean, YouTube is so oversaturated now. The pandemic made everybody a creator, right? And, you know, it's not so much now in the fitness space, especially. And it's very sad to, to say this out loud because, it, you know, it's my passion. But, I mean, people would rather watch me do stupid shit in the gym than actually educate, get education on proper exercise and nutrition. It's just what the the world's turned into right now in, in the fitness space. And the pendulum always swings both ways. And I've I've started to notice it got really bad over the course of the last couple of years, but I have started to notice people are like, oh, okay, yeah, another funny video of some guy like, you know, bench pressing a couch who gives a shit, right? Um <laughs> so it's starting to go back to to the to the the good side of the force. Um but around that time, three years ago, it was starting to get really bad. I was kind of feeling a bit um, burnt out from fitness content. Uh, I remember sitting in my in my gym with my editor, Ricky, and I had a, I had a series called Insta Garbage where I would kind of like rip on people that were doing things wrong. And originally, that series started because these videos were just were just popping up as I was scrolling and I was just getting irritated and I was like this video is ridiculous it's, you know these the first one I ever made was on these kids they're called the organic twins which they're roided out of their minds they were then even more so now and they were showing like different ways to bench press using plates and it was like the, the stupidest thing I ever saw but it had so many views because people were just like oh wow I've never benched that way before maybe my chest will get bigger if I try that because that's what it is mm -hmm. Hey, let me give you guys, for those of you listening that are in fitness, let me help you understand how fitness content is made, especially with all of these routines that come out every single day. As a creator, you have to keep up with the algorithm. So you have to make videos every single day. So what fitness, con what fitness influencers do is they go to the gym, they do their actual workout, you know, the one that works and gets them pumped. And then as soon as they're done, they take about 15 or 20 minutes and film the bullshit they tell you to do. That's how it works. So just let that sink in for a second there. The basics work for, like, there's only like 25, 30 exercises, well, maybe maybe a little more, uh, that work. Those are the ones you should be doing and you should be progressing with. Anyways, <laughs> fast forward from there. In the beginning of Insta Garbage, the videos were kind of just, you know, in my line of sight. When I was had kind of this, this revelation with Ricky, I was sitting down looking for people to, like, basically shit on. And I looked up at Ricky and I said, is this really my life? Like, am I really sitting here trying to find videos to talk about? Like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life on this channel. And what's even worse is I know people want this content. And I'm like, but that's not why I got started. I, as we talked earlier, I got started because I wanted to help people reach their goals. So it was kind of a combination of a few things. I had just got into crypto. I was introduced to it in a, in a very unique way. And I was kind of getting fed up with what content people wanted to see on fitness. And I was like, you know what? I'll never stop making the fitness videos, but maybe there's something on this crypto side that I can do to try to like revitalize my passion. And I won't feel so pressured to make so much content on YouTube, right? For the fitness thing. And so being a YouTuber, I created a YouTube channel called Scott Herman Fitness. I am uh, Scott Herman Crypto, and I just started you know, diving headfirst into the crypto space. But what I would do is I would watch popular crypto YouTubers, and I would go and join their live streams with my fitness channel because it's bigger and it has a check mark, hoping that people would see me comment. And what I quickly realized is most of these people knew who I was, or they watched my content growing up. And so I would jump in these live streams and start chatting, you know, trying to educate myself. And it was almost like I was, you know, just people accepted me. They wanted to help me. They're reaching out to me personally. And so I got um, kind of fast tracked on, you know, an education in crypto and how to trade and how to do all these things, what to look out for. And I thought, OK, well, maybe I can, you know, start looking at projects, to try to get more involved. And so projects started reaching out to me to cover them. And there were a lot that I covered. There were even more that I didn't. 
but that kind of helped me establish a good foundation of what to look for in a project that has what it takes to, you know, build a solid foundation and scale. As you know, a lot of projects in crypto, it's like the same thing, but just repackaged with a different ducky or bunny, you know, image on the front. That's just literally what it is, unfortunately. And what I noticed was a lot of games in the space were doing really well. Because this, remember, this was like during the bull run of 2021. And to me, as a gamer, I've been a gamer my whole life, um, huge gaming and anime nerd. And it made sense to me because if you could own your in-game assets and you could sell them and trade them, that would be huge. Uh, I have another YouTube channel that I've run for fun on the side called uh, Oh the Hermanity, and it's a gaming YouTube channel. And I stream uh, a mobile game called Dokkan Battles, Dragon Ball Z mobile game. And one of the video, the type of videos that get the most views on there is when a new banner comes out with new characters, and then you use the in-game currency and you summon for them. And because I was making videos, I spent a lot of money buying the in-game currency called Dragon Stones. And so more often than not, I would get doubles of all the characters that I already have. And it would always irritate me that I couldn't just give them away to just on stream. Like, Hey, I don't need this guy, even though he's incredibly rare and hard to get, I don't need him. I'm going to give him to one of you because that's what gaming and community is all about. And so when I learned that that process was just called an NFT, <laughs> right? Digital ownership and on the blockchain. And then that's how you can communicate and send things back and forth. That's when I started looking for a gaming project that understood that and wanted to to do that. And so earlier in this conversation, I mentioned how when I first got started on YouTube, I would respond to all the comments on my videos. That never changed. Even as I hit a million subscribers, two million subscribers, obviously I can't respond to everyone on every video, but I do still dedicate a good amount of time communicating with my community, right? It's the whole point of social media. I get so irritated when I see people post on Twitter looking for engagement, then they get it. And then they just don't even respond to one person. It just doesn't make any sense. So I've always just been very active on anything I'm, on my social channels. One of my uh, friends that was, that I met just, you know, from responding introduced me to wag me. It was like, Hey, check these guys out. They get a strong team. They have a great project. Um, I think that you really like it. And so I set up a meeting with them, with my business partner, Costas, who'd been working with me on Scott Herman Fitness for about 12 years. And after the meeting was over, I said to Costas, I was like, dude, this is probably the first team we've talked to in over a year that has their shit together, knows how to build businesses, ha has experience building you know, businesses before this, before crypto, been successful, understands marketing, understands scaling, and understands how to you know, go out and get what they need versus trying to do everything themselves. And so that was kind of the, the transition of from fitness to crypto. I've never stopped the fitness. Obviously, I've had to, you know, scale it down quite a bit to, to do what I'm doing over here. But it was it was just this transition of when I jumped into crypto, everybody was like, hey, Scott's here. He taught me how to deadlift in college. I like him. I mean, let me show him around. Yeah. So what's interesting there is obviously you're looking for a project to get involved in. And then on the Wagme side, like how did you work out what role you take within the startup, right? Like what was the, obviously you've got the skills of building the channel and all of that kind of area. How was that discussion of like working out how you'd fit into the team and where they could best utilize your skills that you built up as a creator? Yeah, so it kind of, it kind of came together on its own, right? Some of the best things in life, that just, it just happens. It just kind of unfolds. So interestingly they when they reached out to me they were about three months old so they basically started the project got some funding and then had a community and they said hey you know we're not going to do any any sort of outreach until we at least have a working um alpha of the game and they had reached out to a company called cubics cubic started building the game and then right around that time they were ready to reach out and they were launching um the genesis nft collection on OpenSea. And that essentially was your pass to be able to play the alpha. And there was a lot of other utility there too. I mean, there still is a lot of utility there too, but that's essentially what that was. And so first, um, from what I heard later, uh, they reached out to BitBoy and he wanted like 75K just to talk to them. And they were like, uh, no. <laughs> as much as he, he denies it, everybody can find his rate card. You type in BitBoy rate card on Google, it'll pop up, it's real. 
And so they, I mean, they didn't know any better back then, right? They just said, well, this guy's the best. Everyone watches his content. Maybe we should try to get him to take a look at our project and then talk about it. But, you know, if you don't pay 75K, it doesn't happen. So after that, um, again, somebody from their community reached out to me and then I reached out to them and we had a meeting. And although I did, you know, I did get paid for helping them mint out that collection. It wasn't anywhere near 75K. <laughs> Maybe I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> but essentially they hired me to, to do what I do best, which is networking and community building. And at that time I had, you know, been into crypto for about a year. There was a lot of other popular crypto YouTubers at the time that were making a lot of content and I had become friends with them. And so when I came on board with WAGME and I dove into everything that they were doing, I reached out to all of my other friends in the space that were making content. And I was like, hey guys, I'm working with this company called WAGME. We're, we're launching this Genesis NFT collection. I really believe in this team. I really believe in this game. Can you help me out, make some content, you know, do some tweets and, and help me kind of expose, you know, bring the, the, the vision to life. And they were like, sure. Right. And so a lot of people kind of got on board. We minted out the Genesis NFT collection in about a week. So it took about seven days, which is incredible, raised 1.2 million for the company. And after that first month of working with them, my business partner, Casas and I said, hey, like we really believe in what you guys are doing here we want to join the team as co-founders. And honestly, like it was very little convincing. Like we were like, Hey, we want to still work with you. We want but we want to join as co-founders. And they were like, all right, great. Let's do it. <laughs> like it wasn't really this massive like negotiation or anything. Clearly like they had all the pieces to the puzzle, but they were missing one. And that one piece was me. They had, you know, marketing, they had the business foundation, they had the blockchain, they had the tech. And all that stuff, what they really needed on the team was somebody who understood community building and networking and content creation. Because I'll tell you what, when you have a content creator working on the core team who, like, for example, if I were to hire a content creator to do stuff for Wagme, I'm going to have to like download so much information into their brain to get them to understand how I want them to make the videos and to get them to just to understand the project in general. And it's a lot. It's a lot of, of information. I actually even remember in the beginning here feeling a bit overwhelmed with all of the different, um, you know, aspects of the business. Right. But now you'll notice on the Wagme Games YouTube channel, whenever we need to make an announcement, like it's just me. Like, hey, what's up? Here's the announcement. Here's all this. It's the videos are well edited. Right. Everything just comes across very natural because I don't have to you know, educate myself. I've been getting educated on everything we're doing for the last two years. So yeah, I guess it just worked out that I was the, the missing piece. And, you know, it also helps that I understand how to build and scale a business too, right? Scott Herman Fitness, MuscularStrength.com, businesses that I've built. I know how to work with other brands. Um, and I'm just, you know, I like to make friends everywhere I go. So that helps too. Yeah. And I like you said that because you see it so often now. People are hiring content creators or influencers to promote their brands. But often they're spending quite a lot of money on this. Whereas if you get somebody who does have that alignment and does have that business mindset, then them being on board, because obviously you're way more motivated with Wagme because you're part of the team. You've got, like, you can influence the decisions they're making. They're not just telling you this is what you've got to go and promote. You're part of those conversations and it, you're included in that as well. And I think it's one of the things that maybe a lot of content creators where sometimes they are just happy to take the check, where it's in that longer term game can you be part of something where you can really build out and have that? Because obviously it's fun to work with a team too, right? A lot of content creators can be quite lonely because you're focusing your content and you, may have, you might have people helping you. Whereas as part of Wagme, you're part of this team now where instead of you just being somebody they hire to do stuff for them, you're actually part of that team. So have you found that experience as something which has been quite fulfilling for you or have you found that transition? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's really motivating to work extremely hard on a project that, you know, you're a co-founder of, right? So, for example, uh, you know, we've hired influencers in the past to do a video for us, right? Just try to get the word out there on different channels. And <laughs> they literally just pull up the website and read it. I'm like, that's not what we asked you to do, <laughs> you know? And then, 
as they're reading it, you can tell like it's like they have like glossy eyes, right? Like they're not even paying attention. They're just like, oh yeah, this is Wagme, and you know it's a game, and it takes place in 3022, and they got these cool like Genesis NFTs and this cool like game, and you know this cool thing here, and this is cool. I hear the the fuck the freaking word cool a hundred times. I'm like, that's not it's not what we wanted. Sorry, bro. Like, yeah, see you later. Um, and then also, but you have to understand too, like as a creator, you can't just be doing things for free, right? When I create content for Wagme as a co-founder, I mean, I'm, a, I'm not doing it for free, but I'm not getting paid per video. Like I'm doing it because I'm a co-founder and I'm, and I'm trying to build the brand. And when I work with other creators now, especially now that we have a game that's in beta and I'm doing a lot of these live streams, uh, when I speak to them on their needs, like they, they're happy to talk to me because I understand both sides of the coin, which is something you don't find in big business. You know, um, for example, something that would always irritate me is brands would want to work with me on the fitness side, even brands that were my sponsors, you know, for a long time, I would have to like, like get on their ass about promoting the content they were asking me to make. And it's just, it, it, it seems so obvious, right? Like if you make a commercial, you then have to promote that commercial on TV or wherever you want people to see it. A lot of brands just think, oh, this creator has a lot of subscribers. So if they make a video, those subscribers will come to us. And it's like, well, maybe some will, but if you're having them make a video and you really want to utilize their talent as a creator, which is why you hired them to begin with, you have to put some marketing dollars to help push that video through the algorithm bullshit that's on YouTube or Twitter or, or things like that and treat it like a traditional media. And so with me, they don't have to pay me, right? <laughs> they can just put the money towards marketing the, the, the content that I create, which is great. And, you know, and I'll sit here, some of these videos, I like to film my videos in one shot. So if I'm filming a video and I'm showing a bunch of different like uh, windows like OpenSea or the website or gameplay or photos, and I'm showing all these things in one video, I literally have um, you know a Chrome window up with all of those things on different tabs. And so as I'm talking, I'm just clicking through them. And, and you know if it's a 10 minute video and I screw up eight minutes in, like it's time to start over, right? <laughs> And then I'll open the folder where all my recordings go. Sometimes I'm just like, oh, damn, I screwed up a lot today. I like 30 different video takes. And a lot of it's just getting the intro right. If I don't like the intro, I restart. Like, just restart, restart, restart. But that's how I've always been. Even in my fitness content, you'll notice that a lot of it, I just do it in one take. Or there's maybe one cut. Because I'm like, okay, that was good. I just need to re, you know, realign myself here. Um, even when I was working for Lionsgate, we would do uh, these 20 minute workout DVDs and the guy that was filming, his name is Cal Pozo. He did like, you know, insanity. He did Jane Fonda. He did all these people. And he was like, you're, you're in the top, like less than 1% of people I've ever worked with that does the entire 20 minute workout without stopping or having to take a break. Right. And just like, there's three cameras and I know where camera one is camera two, camera three. I know when to take a break and go help somebody to explain something like, but cause I enjoy it, right? It's not a job. I enjoy it. And with this, I get irritated if I screw up 30 times, but I also enjoy it. That's why I'm here. I'm passionate about it. So I'll do 30 takes to get it right. So let's say people listening now are thinking about they've built a bit of a following and they're thinking about like one day they want to go down the same route you have and transition from being a content creator, also being a founder or joining another company as an in-house content creator and like community builder. What advice would you give them? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, I would go back to that original statement where like figure out what you're, why you're doing what you're doing, because it's really easy to fall into this trap of just creating content every single day. And, and to be honest, I felt like I was starting to fall into that trap with my fitness channel because, again, the algorithm is changing so much on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube. And it's now it's almost like you're getting punished if you take a break. Like you're literally a slave to the algorithm. And like, don't take that statement lightly if you're listening to this. Like you will become a slave to YouTube, a slave to TikTok, a slave to Instagram. They don't give a shit that you want to do other fun, cool things in your life or, 
you know, God forbid you want to spend some time with your family or play catch with your dog or, you know, go to your kid's baseball game. No, 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 no. They want you home making content so that they can, you know, utilize that to get more people on their platform. And I think a lot of people forget that YouTube is a business. So something that not a lot of people are aware of is, you know, YouTube, they shadow ban channels all the time. Like my, my channel is shadow banned like crazy because it's an old channel. They don't care about me. They want you. They want the new creator to come on YouTube to get excited. They want to give you, they want to give you a little taste of what it's like to be in the limelight. And then after you've done, you're done creating content for six months and your views are, are amazing, they just go, ah, flip the switch. Now we're going to make you work harder for less views. And we're going to move on to the next group of people to get them hooked on making content. And when I explain that to people, it's almost like you can see the light bulb go off. Because when you are when you first start making content on YouTube, you're just like, oh, it's a place for me to make content and post videos you know, and get monetized. And then when you start to realize, wait, it's actually a business. They don't care about me or my content. They just want more and more people, right? So unless you've built a following that's literally searching your name every day, trying to find your latest video, chances of you just popping up in their, in their feed of what's new, you know, it's 50-50. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. Sometimes you won't even get notifications for people you're subscribed to. Like it's just... It's BS, and that's just how it is. And any you talk to anyone who's been on YouTube longer than two or three years, they'll tell you the same exact thing. And I know because I've had these conversations. Like I won't even bring it up, and they'll they'll start talking about it. And I'm like, okay, I'm not alone on this. Um, anyways, so now that you're 100% discouraged about making content, uh, <laughs> what I would suggest is you need balance. So you don't want your only stream of income to be YouTube right? Like you need to build an email list, maybe build a website, like build some other place for your community to go to, to interact with you, whatever that might be. So that as you're building your social media profile, as you're gaining subscribers and you're getting all these great views, Hey, by the way, you know, if you watch, if you enjoy my content, just go to my website and sign up for my email because I like to send funny things or whatever, whatever it is, extra, extra fitness tips. If you sign up here for free, right? Things like that. You need to figure out again, why you're making the content, what the future is, you know, next five to 10 years. And no, what are you going to do if YouTube closes the doors tomorrow? And and people don't think about that either. Um, Like, okay, I'm making all this money on YouTube and Instagram, you know, and, uh, and Twitter, and then they all shut down and like, yeah, we're not monetizing anymore. Um, I actually got of a firsthand slap in the face from Facebook, you know, before Facebook started putting their promote your post, I had like 700, no, like, like 500,000 followers on my Facebook page. This is probably like, you know, 2010 or 2011. And I'm getting, you know, two to 3000 likes every photo. And then all of a sudden this, you know, pay to promote button pops up and my photos get from, go from getting 300 likes to like 150, 200. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. You know, thank you very much. I'm I'm so happy I built this page for the last, you know, eight years for you just to screw me over like this. Again, it's a business. You don't own your Facebook page. You don't own your YouTube page. You know, we see people get demonetized all the time for for shit that makes absolutely no sense. Like literally you could be living the good life and then all that stuff gets shut down. So when we talk about another reason why I moved into the gaming space, it's like, I have my fitness business. I have my website. I wanted to build something else that I was passionate about that also didn't rely on just YouTube and social media, right? Having a game that's downloadable from the app store, right? And people playing it and having fun. And then it's on their phone. And like, there's no, there's no like shadow banning, right? If you download my game and it's on your home screen, every day you open your phone, you're going to play that game and have fun. So again, just try to figure out how you can turn opportunities into a business that you enjoy. So thanks so much for coming on today, Scott. Have you got, where should people be checking out to learn more about you and learn more about Wagby? So obviously, as we know, you've got massive YouTube channels. So what are they on? So you guys can check us out on YouTube, Wagby Game. Um, The easiest thing to do is to go to Twitter. That's where we're the most active. So go to our official Twitter, Wagby Game uh, Co, C-O. 
Um, or you can follow me, Scott underscore Herman. I have all the links there too, obviously. And our DMs are always open. Yeah, it's something that I talk about quite a bit. DMs are open. If you guys are having questions or you want to play the beta or if you just want to get more involved with the community, like just join our Twitter and interact with us because we'll interact back. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, brother.